the last time with the proposition that to understand the Hebrew dietary laws given to them by Yehovah on Mount Sinai, we must understand that in doing so, God placed diet directly at the center of holiness and purity as he defines it. Food was a major issue since the time of Adam and Eve. In fact, we find it wasn't until after the great flood that the killing of animals for meat was even prohibit, uh, was even permitted by the Lord. For sure, the Jewish sages and many rabbis have expanded the dietary laws into such complexity that sometimes it's hard to realize that God's rules in the Torah about food were few and basic. But before we get to food per se, <coughs> Let's talk about holiness and purity they're, and their opposites. Holy is the opposite of common. Just as clean is the opposite of unclean. Common means just what it says. Common has neither special value nor position. It's typical. It's usual. It's not set apart. And the term applies to the largest group. That is, common means that there is more of it than its opposite. Holy, on the other hand, holds the highest position. It carries the greatest value. Holy means something that's rare. Holy means something that's unusual, set apart. And in context with the Bible and, and current physical world, Holy represents a minority that is set apart for service to God. Very little and precious few are holy. Almost everything is common. Therefore, everything that is common is not holy. Something can't be holy and common at the same time. Nor can something be clean and unclean at the same time. For instance, Jehovah deemed Israel as being holy and the rest of the world as common. Israel was not somewhat common and somewhat holy. In fact, nothing can be a combination of holy and common. This is not a philosophy. This is not an ideal it's a hard, fast, fundamental axiom that rules the universe. Everything in this current world since the fall of Adam and Eve Eve begins as something common. You, me, plants, animals, dirt, water, everything. In the negative, we could say that nothing in this world in its natural state is holy. Can something that begins as common become holy? Thank you, Yeshua. Yes, it can. Can something begin as common becomes, become holy? Well, if you're a believer, that's what's happened to you. How does something common, like you and me, become holy? we must be sanctified. That is, the creator of the universe has to declare us as holy. Once something is sanctified, it's no longer common. You're no longer common. You're not holy. A common thing doesn't start out with a little bit of, a little bit of holiness and it gets a little holier and a little holier and a little holier over time with your effort or merit. Things and people are either holy or they're not. Once a common thing is sanctified and becomes holy, it leaves its state of commonness behind. Now, think on that Torah principle for a second. As believers, you and I are called sanctified. The instant we place our trust in Yeshua HaMashiach, God declares us sanctified, the Holy Spirit enters us, we shed the common, we become holy. Our Western church way of saying it 
is that we leave the old self behind and we become a new person in Christ. Which is absolutely correct. But this is just a modern Gentile way of re-expressing the ancient Torah concept of the common becoming holy at God's decision. It's so important for us to grasp that just like the Israelites, once God declares you holy, you're no longer common, despite how you may, may still view yourself. As a believer, you're 100% holy in his eyes. Non-believers are 100% common. Now believe that. Trust it and live it out. So let's peel this onion back one more layer. Common things can be divided into two separate and distinct groups. Clean and unclean. Only clean common things are eligible to become sanctified. That is, only common things that are also clean can become holy. Unclean common things cannot become holy. In Leviticus chapters 11 through 16, we're going to find God's lists of what denotes clean common things and what denotes unclean common things. Despite what modern church doctrines might say, the reality is that what constitutes clean and unclean, holy and common, are not defined in the New Testament. For that, we have to turn to the Torah. Now, clean things can be polluted by contact with unclean things. But unclean things can't be cleansed by contact with clean things. It's a one-way street. When something clean comes into something comes into contact with something unclean the result is always that now both things are unclean we have a similar condition when dealing with the holy the result of the holy coming into contact with the common is that the holy becomes defiled however it never happens that the common thing that touches holiness is allowed to become holy merely because of some accidental contact. That said, certain incidents in the Old Testament show that while it may be theoretically possible for holiness to be transmitted to something common or unclean by simple contact, the contact has to first be divinely authorized by the Lord or he interrupts the process by destroying that thing that has touched the holy. And we see many instances of that in the, in the uh, Bible. Thus, while it really makes the whole question kind of kind of moot. So in the end, it winds up being one of those one-way streets. Now stay with me. I, I know this is deep and it's technical for Western believers to deal with because we've never been introduced to these biblical realities. But we should have been when we first believed. Now what I'm trying to show you using mere words is something almost indescribable in the form of spiritual principles that the Lord has built into the entire universe. Everything operates in accordance with these principles. Nothing is exempt. There aren't any exceptions. If we're going to understand or even remotely grasp what salvation is and why it's so necessary if we're going to understand how to live in the manner God expects of us then these are the core principles that we must understand and digest and I'm sad to say that most Christians will never in their entire church lives encounter an explanation of these principles but any six or seven year old Jewish child who has gone to a typical Jewish school will already know them by heart. Even if they don't fully comprehend yet the significance of it. So back to some more explanation. While everything in the world begins as common, <clears throat> Most things become, begin as clean. 
clean and common are generally but not entirely the current natural state of the following world. So what we see then is that on the one extreme is the holy, on the other extreme is the unclean. And in between those two lay the common and the clean as a kind of middle ground. The middle ground, clean, it can be pulled in one way or the other. It can go in one of two directions. It can be made holy by means of sanctification. It can be made unclean by means of defilement. Something holy can't ever be allowed to come into contact with something unclean. The result is that the holy is defiled and the unclean thing gets annihilated. So here's the easiest rule for you to remember about everything I've just described. Common and clean is the natural and the beginning state of most things, mankind included. Common and clean things can be elevated into something holy or common and clean things can be degraded into something unclean. Now we're going to hear a lot of the words clean and pure in the Torah. They mean the same thing. For all practical purposes they're synonymous. Well with these basic rules of purity to go by and understanding that these rules underlay the basic fabric of the entire universe as we know it, then we can begin to see why there were some barriers put up by God between his holy self and common man. Now Adam and Eve were unique because they were created in a holy state. Therefore, they could have almost unlimited contact with the holy Jehovah. But after they rebelled, they weren't holy anymore. Now they were common. As such, they couldn't have contact with his presence. That's why the Lord had them put where? Outside the garden. His earthly dwelling place. He even had a fearsome angel put there to make sure they didn't try to get back in. You remember that? See, but it was less a matter of punishment upon Adam and Eve, more a matter of God protecting his holiness. That's why he erected a barrier. And that is the same state that we currently find ourselves in as mankind, on the outside looking in. God's holiness must be protected. He will not allow himself to be defiled. He will protect his holiness at all costs. Only something that is holy can come into contact with a holy God, period. I mean, do you see this? Do you see this? Now here is a second rule that is made most clear by the Torah. And it is, it was in effect from the first day of creation and the rule is simply repeated in the New Testament. The rule is that the only way something common can ever become holy is if God authorizes it by means of his grace. The church word for this process or event of the common becoming holy is sanctification or for the more evangelical it's called being saved. In the era of Moses and up until Christ's death, God granted his grace upon those whom he called. And whom he called was Israel. God granted his grace upon Israel contingent upon them obeying the Torah rules and rituals that he ordained. Now today, God's grace is available to all humans contingent upon them trusting solely in the finished work of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. This is also called grace because man can't do anything without this grace. We can't gain salvation without God's grace. But in either era, Moses or Christ's, holiness was granted by means of God's grace. That's how you got it. Look, most modern people tend to see the end game of salvation as being forgiven and cleansed from our sin. That's it. 
But that's not really it. The real end game is being declared holy so that we can be in the presence of the ultimate holiness. The holy God, Yehovah, which is what he's always desired. He wants us back in the Garden of Eden with him. He wants to remove that angel. He wants no barriers. Salvation, forgiveness of sins, is that means for our becoming holy. Therefore, a human who is born common, which is everybody, and who remains common all of his or her life and dies common, never becomes holy. And therefore, they can never, throughout all eternity, come into the presence of his holiness. But a man who is born common, again, all of mankind, but is declared holy by God by means of trust in Yeshua, lives his life, we live our lives in a holy state, we die in a holy state, and we remain in the presence of holiness for all eternity. Talk about polarization. Holiness, purity, and cleanliness, cleanness rather, are the fundamental issues that all believers should be concerning ourselves with at all times. The Hebrews of the biblical times were obsessed with purity, with cleanness issues for very good reason. Their status of being holy could be lost. Please grasp that the typical Hebrew marched up and down a spiritual ladder with holiness at the top and uncleanness at the bottom. And if they broke the law, they sinned. They disobeyed one of the commandments given to them by Moses. Their holiness was put into a state of suspension, so to speak. Disobedience to the Torah degraded them down to a common state. But even worse, they could commit acts that made them unclean. Now let me say that again. Disobedience to most Torah commandments brought them to a temporary state of being common, but typically clean. Keep clean and common, but no longer holy. Yet there were other acts that they could commit, such as touching a dead body which not only degraded them to a common state, it made them unclean. Unclean and common. So the first thing an unclean person had to do was become clean again. Step one. They had to get back to what I would kind of call a neutral state, which is common and clean. That's the purpose of the ritual purity laws. And remember that part of the process of an unclean person becoming ritually pure again was bathing in a mikvah, a ritual bath. Once a person who was unclean for whatever reason was made clean again, then they could go to the sacrificial system. Then they could perform the appropriate sacrifice to regain their status as holy. So the ritual purity provisions were for bringing a person from an unclean state back into a clean state. The sacrificial system was to bring a person in a clean and common state back into a state of acceptable holiness. Two different things. The term used to describe this, this process of regaining the holy status that has been put on hold is atonement. Atonement had to be made in the form of a specific animal sacrifice in order to elevate a person who was common and clean back into a state of holiness. I keep repeating back into a state of holiness because a person who has never been declared holy by God can't make himself holy simply by performing the purity and the atonement rituals. That doesn't do it. So the typical Hebrew was on this constantly moving elevator up and down the holiness scale. Is it any wonder that Paul and other Torah observant Jews who understood and accepted what Christ did for them were so excited <laughs> 
to explain it all to their Jewish friends. No more up and down the ladder of holiness. No more in Jehovah's presence one day and barred from it the next. Christ's sacrifice of atonement put the believer into a permanent state of holiness, never to be common again. One final comment, we're going to read Leviticus chapter 11. Of all the great quests undertaken by rabbis and sages and Bible scholars, ancient or recent, Jewish or Gentile, few subjects have been so challenging as, as to comprehensively identify the underlying meaning of the term holiness. What does God mean by the term holiness? What did Moses mean by it? It is understood by Jews and Christians alike that one attribute of holiness is separateness, set apart. Yet that somehow seems incomplete, inadequate. Leviticus shows us there's far more involved than that simplistic statement. For instance, what is the nature of holiness? How is holy dif holiness different from all other possible states of being? What's the chief characteristic of holiness? Of all the explanations that I have come across, the one that best brings it together for me, the one that seems most true to the Word of God, blending the spiritual with the physical, is this. The chief nature of holiness is wholeness and completeness. Wholeness and completeness. Nothing lacking. Without imperfection. And after we read chapter 11, we're going to take a further look at holiness and more of its characteristics. So for now, open up your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 11. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 119. We're going to read all of chapter 11. Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, Tell the people of Israel, These are the living creatures which you may eat among all the land animals. Any that has a separate hoof, which is completely divided, and chews the cud, these animals you may eat. But you may not eat those that only chew the cud or only have a separate hoof. For example, the camel, the coney, and the hare are unclean for you because they chew the cud, but they don't have a separate hoof. While the pig is unclean for you, because although it has a separate and divided hoof, it doesn't chew the cud. You're not to eat meat from these or touch their carcasses. They're unclean for you. Of all things that live in the water, you may eat these. Anything in the water that has fins and scales, whether in seas or in rivers, these you may eat. But everything in the seas and rivers without both fins and scales of all the small water creatures, of all the living creatures in the water, this is a detestable thing for you. Yes, these will be detestable for you. You're not to eat their meat, you're not, and you are to detest their carcasses. Whatever lacks fins and scales in the water is a detestable thing for you. The following creatures of the air are to be detestable for you. They are not to be eaten. The eagle, the vulture, the osprey, the kite, various kinds of ravens, the ostrich, the screech owl, the seagull, various kinds of hawks, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the horned owl, the pelican, the barn owl, the stork, various kinds of herons, the hoopoe and the bat. All winged swarming creatures that go on all fours are a detestable thing for you. Except that of all winged swarming creatures that go on all fours, you may eat those that have jointed legs above their feet, enabling them to jump off the ground.
Specifically, of these you may eat the various kinds of, of locusts, grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets. But other than that, all winged swarming creatures have, having four feet are a detestable thing for you. The following will make you unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of them will be unclean until evening. And whoever picks up any part of their carcass is to wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. Every animal that has a separate but incompletely divided hoof or that doesn't chew the cud is unclean for you. Anyone who touches them will become unclean. Whoever, uh, whatever goes on its paws among all animals that go on all fours is unclean for you. Whoever touches its carcass will be unclean until evening. Whoever picks up its carcass is to wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. These are unclean for you. The following are unclean for you among the small creatures that swarm on the ground. The weasel, the mouse, the various kinds of lizards, the gecko, the land crocodile, the skink, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean crawling creatures. Whoever touches them when they are dead will be unclean until evening. Anything on which one of them falls when dead will become unclean. Wooden utensil, article of clothing, leather, sacking, any utensil used for work, it must be put in water and it will be unclean until evening, then it will be clean. If one of them falls into a clay pot, whatever's in it will become unclean. You're to break the pot. Any food permitted to be eaten that water from such a vessel gets on will become unclean, and any permitted liquid in such a vessel will become unclean. Everything on which any carcass part of theirs falls will become unclean, whether oven or stove, is to be broken into pieces. They are unclean and will be unclean for you, although a spring or cistern for collecting water remains clean. But anyone who touches one of their carcasses will become unclean. If any carcass part of theirs falls on any kind of seed to be sown, it's clean. But if water is put on the seed and a carcass part of theirs falls on it, it's unclean for you. If an animal of a kind that you are permitted to eat dies, whoever touches it, whoever touches its carcass will be unclean until evening. A person who eats meat from its carcass or carries its carcass is to wash his clothes. He'll be unclean until evening. Any creature that swarms on the ground is a detestable thing. It is not to be eaten. Whatever moves on its stomach, goes on all fours, or has many legs, all creatures that swarm on the ground, you're not to eat them. These are a detestable thing. You are not to make yourselves detestable with any of these Swarming, crawling creatures, do not make yourselves unclean with them. Do not defile yourselves with them. For I am Adonai your God. Therefore consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. Do not defile yourselves with any kind of swarming creature that moves along the ground. For I am Adonai who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Therefore you are to be holy because I am holy. Such then is the law concerning animals, flying creatures, all living creatures that move about in the water, all creatures that swarm on the ground. Its purpose is to distinguish between the clean, uh, the unclean and the clean and between the creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. By the way, and I'm going to repeat this a number of times, look at that last statement. Its purpose is to distinguish between the clean and the unclean and between the creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. Unclean and clean versus acceptable and prohibited are two different sets of rules. They're not synonymous. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to bring that up over and over and we'll talk about it at length as these lessons go on. In verse 1 we find that Jehovah is speaking, presumably audibly, to both Moses and Aaron. And he tells them they are to teach Israel what he's about to pronounce to them. God's first important instruction is that Israel may eat, freely eat now living creatures. This is a milestone. This is the first time that Jehovah has given a list of exactly 
which animals could be eaten with his blessing. Oh yeah, men had been eating meat for a long time. But not before now is there a record of there being limits on a species of animals other than the limit not to eat the blood of a living creature. In the beginning, living creatures, animals, were meant to be a companion for mankind. After the fall, they were to be killed and used for the purpose of sacrificing to Jehovah so that mankind could atone for his sin by using that innocent animal's blood. After the flood, God told Noah how an animal was to be properly killed and eaten, but he didn't particularly specify some animals as acceptable and other animals as off-limits for food. Genesis 9.1 God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will be upon every wild animal and every bird in the air and every creature populating the ground and all the fish in the sea. They've been handed over to you. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you. Just as I gave you green plants before, now I give you everything. Only flesh with its life, which is in the blood, you're not to eat. Now in Leviticus 11, the Lord was allowing men to eat living creatures, but only of certain types. Interestingly, sometime after Yeshua comes, again, animals are not going to be permitted for food. So get used to it. Eat those apples. Go get that spinach. The Hebrew word for living creature is haya. A very generic term for any type of living creature, but not for plant life. And the first group of living creatures from which men can kill and eat are, in Hebrew, bema. And bema denotes two characteristics. They are land animals, as opposed to sea creatures or animals that fly in the air. And these animals that currently are, or rather these are animals that currently are, or they can be, domesticated. Cattle, sheep, goats, things like that. We're going to see that Yehovah is, will show men that they can kill and eat animals that inhabit three different spheres of the earth. That is, three different types of earthly environment. That water, the air, and the land. This has a lot of spiritual meaning, which we'll get into later. Now, of the Bema, the land animals that Israel may freely kill and eat are declared to be clean. Why are they clean and others aren't? Oh, that's a biggie. Again, we'll go into depth on that matter sometime over the next few weeks. For now, the primary notion to hang on to is that they are clean because God said so. It's about that simple. But note this. Until Israel was elected, divided, and separated from all other nations by the Lord, all people on earth were of the same status in God's eyes. Common. Once God took Israel and set them apart as his chosen people and redeemed them, suddenly the world became divided into two distinct groups of people with a different status. Those who were holy and everybody else. And more to the point, Israel and everybody else. The everybody else are what the Bible calls Gentiles. Now that he has separated Israel out to be holy, he begins to separate animals into clean and unclean, suitable and unsuitable, permitted and prohibited. Yehovah lays down a visible means for Israel to discern which of the many kinds of behama he approves for use as food. Physical characteristic number one is that a, an approved behama must have a cloven hoof. Physical characteristic number two is it must chew the cud. So, what's a cloven hoof? Well, basically it means the hoof split. 
such that at some point it separates into two completely separate parts, like two toes. Many animals like horses have hooves that split at one end, but they don't completely separate front and back to form two separate pieces. Therefore, horses have uncloven hooves and are deemed unfit to eat. In the biblical way of speaking, they are unclean. And, or better, as we get deeper into the issue of diet in later lessons, we're going to again see that prohibited is a more appropriate word than unclean in this context. Now, chewing the cud for you non-farmers or ranchers is a little bit on the gross side. So for you city slickers, I need to explain what that means so that it's well understood. Basically, it means that the animal only partially chews its food, it swallows it, and then it whoop, brings it back up again when it's more convenient, and it chews on it a little bit more, and it swallows it again, and so on. And technically, animals with this characteristic are called ruminants. Animals whose stomachs usually consist of four compartments. So chewing the cud is basically a description of how a certain animal's digestive system works. Thus far, we have four necessary characteristics of a clean or acceptable and edible bema. It's a land animal. It's a domesticated animal. It has to have a fully cloven hoof and it has to chew the cud. Now, in verse 4, Yehovah gives us some examples of common animals that were typically used for food in that era, but they were off limits for Israel. And he explains just why they are off limits. The camel, for instance, chews the cud, doesn't have a cloven hoof. The hyrax chews the cud, it doesn't have a cloven hoof. Matter of fact, it really didn't have a hoof at all. The hare chews the cud, but doesn't have hooves, cloven, or otherwise. And now for perhaps the best known symbol of an animal uh, that is not prohibited, the pig. It does indeed have a cleft hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. To be clear, these are not the only unclean or unprohibited or, or, or prohibited animals. They're just illustrations used in the Torah. So perhaps it's good for us to learn the Hebrew word that is translated as unclean because we're going to run into it time and again in the Torah. That word is tameh. Let's be very clear about this term. Tameh. Unclean. It has nothing to do with hygiene or whether it is inherently edible by humans. Rather, it's a spiritual matter. Yehovah has for his own good reasons declared by fiat that certain animals are not to be eaten by anyone considered to be one of his people. Verse 8 gives us another important bit of information. Yehovah instructs that unclean animals may not be eaten and an Israelite cannot touch the dead carcass of one either. What this means is that if for some reason you stumble over a dead animal or have to kill one for some purpose, you can't touch it. However, as we find out in later chapters, there's no prohibition against touching a live, unclean animal. Catch that? A, touching, a lot, touching a pig does not make you unclean if it's live. Therefore, a hare could be a pet or a camel. Could be ridden. Or a beast of burden could be used by Israel. No problem. You just can't eat it. You can't touch it if, it, if it's killed by a wild animal or it dies. Now verse 9 begins to deal with living creatures from the water sphere. Sea creatures, fresh or salt water. And the most visible characteristic of an approved for eating sea creature is it has to have fins and scales. 
So any sea creature that has both fins and scales is clean. It's, pro it's allowed for eating. Clean, by the way, is in Hebrew tahor. Tame, unclean, tahor, clean. Unclean sea creatures are ones that the Bible calls swarming. And the Hebrew being translated as swarming in English is shratz. And it means, well, it has this idea of, of, of crawling as well as swarming. Now, exactly what swarming means is, is a little harder to decipher. It seems to carry with it the idea of randomness. Something that, that, that tends to stay in a group, but something that also pre unpredictably darts around. It does not refer to fishes that school. The chief characteristic of the unclean sea creature is that rather than swim through the water using its fins, it crawls on the bottom or it slithers around like a snake. So for instance, shellfish are considered tame, unclean. Lobsters and crabs, sorry, are also off limits, as are eels and sea snakes. Now in verse 10, a kind of super category of unclean animals introduced, something described as shakets, shakets in Hebrew. Shakets is translated as detestable or an abomination. It's something to be avoided at all costs. And just as we've seen sin categorized, and then sacrificial rituals requiring a hierarchy of animals from the least to the most valuable to be used in according to the nature of that sin, its seriousness, we see that unclean things seem to have some kind of classification as well, based on the least and the most. The term shakets, detestable, an abomination is reserved for the worst, the most serious category. A good thing to know as we go through the Bible because we can all probably think of a verse or two in which Jehovah calls something an abomination before him. That is really bad. It's the worst sort. Well, the Torah moves quickly now to creatures that inhabit the air sphere, creatures that fly. And since there are several types of creatures that fly, the first category to deal with is the most obvious, birds. And interestingly, in a deviation from previous practice, rather than describe the characteristics of the clean and therefore edible bird, it describes the characteristics of the unclean bird with the idea that all the other varieties can be eaten. So we get a list of birds that are held shakets, not just unclean, but really unclean, an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the kite, and the falcon are named first, followed by a couple of kinds of owls, pelican, a stork, even a bat. Yeah, I know, a bat's not a bird. All right, but by tradition, Hebrews and Arabs put a bat in the bird category. The common attribute of all these birds is that they are either birds of prey, which kill and eat other living creatures, or, as with vultures, they eat carrion. However, please note that the scriptures do not specifically say that the attribute of eating other living creatures is what makes birds on this list unclean. I mean, certain other birds like chickens, again, for you non-farmers, they'll eat anything. And I mean anything. They'll eat rodents. I've seen a chicken chase a mouse across a barnyard and get it, and eat it. All right, so we need to be a little bit cautious. And by the way, chickens are considered clean animals. So we need to be a little bit cautious about assigning a reason for the list of unclean birds, why they're unclean. Because the Bible doesn't really give us specifically the reasons. Now next in verse 20, we get another category of living creatures that reside in the air sphere. Insects, flying insects. Now what in the world are insects doing in a list of food? Kosher or not? <laughs> 
Insects were a normal and everyday part of diet in most societies of that era. And Yehovah tells the Israelites which insects they could eat. He does so by giving a broad and sweeping category of insects that are detestable, shakets, and then he lists the exceptions to the rule. Those that would be acceptable. All insects with wings and that swarm and that have four legs are prohibited except for four kinds of locusts and grasshoppers. What's different about them? They have jointed legs. That is, their legs were designed to bend and operate with a springing action so that they can jump or hop. As part of a further discussion of holiness and purity after we've gone through chapter 11, we'll delve into the possible reason why this particular characteristic of hopping on all fours made these insects clean for eating. Okay, now, you ready for a surprise? This pretty much concludes the scriptural, scriptural commandments as regards kosher eating. Done. Oh, we're going to get a little detail added from time to time outside of this chapter. But these 23 verses pretty much do it. Deuteronomy 14 more or less just repeats what we read. Now, I point this out. Because Judaism has evolved these few scriptural laws into this enormous man-made system of dietary rules and regulations complete with ritual hand washing, a prohibition against eating in the presence of Gentiles who might touch your food and defile it. And later as part of what we'll discuss at the end of chapter 11, we're going to get to the famous story of Jesus saying it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean, it's what comes out. In a couple of more weeks, we're going to be a lot better equipped to understand what this issue was that Yeshua was dealing with. And let me preview it by saying that like most things he got into arguments with the Jewish religious leadership over, it all revolved around his revulsion of man-made traditions. Those things that had become these burdensome doctrines of Judaism, not the Torah uh, lessons and teachings of, Torah, of, of Holy Scripture. Well, verse 24 brings into play the concept that we discussed in the previous lesson of the unclean polluting the clean simply by contact. To remind you, the notion is that when something that is unclean touches something that is clean, the clean thing is degraded and it becomes unclean. Never is it the reverse. So beginning in verse 24 we get a list of unclean things that if one comes into contact with one of these you become ritually impure. And there are basically three kinds of contact discussed here. Touching, carrying, and containing. Containing refers to containers like bowls and pots. So from here through about verse 40, we're going to deal with how uncleanness gets transferred from one thing to another thing. Basically the rule is that whoever touches the carcass of some categories of dead animals is considered unclean, but only in a very limited way. They're unclean until sundown that day. Why sundown? Because sundown ends the day and starts a new one. <clears throat> Remember the Hebrew day starts and ends at sundown. Another part of the rule is that anyone who carries the carcass of one of the prohibited dead animals is also clean in sun until sundown. Plus there is the added requirement they must wash their clothing. Their clothing. The list of animals that are clean and unclean is pretty much the same as the list that applies to kosher eating. Animals without cleft hooves and animals that don't chew the cut are unclean when they're dead. But a new category is now discussed. Animals that have paws, like cats or dogs. These are considered unclean for eating and, if they're dead, for touching. These are considered unclean. Once again, it's okay to touch them. Dogs and cats, for instance. Animals with paws. If they're alive, it's fine. 
and the result is the same as if you touch a dead animal that doesn't have a cloven hoof. Notice something interesting about the contamination of an unde unclean dead thing. It cannot only be transmitted to a person, a living human, it's unclean as can be transmitted to inanimate things like clothing. And verse 29 discusses the transmission of uncleanness from a different category of living creatures, those described as swarming, animals that dart about kind of haphazardly. And the list includes mice, rats, and lizards, even crocodiles and presumably alligators. Now you can add all those to the list of unclean things that can't be touched after they're dead. Now as with the previous list of unclean thing, dead things, anyone who touches one contracts uncleanness until the start of a new day, which begins at the end of evening. Now please notice that we're being taught that death is unclean. Why is that? Because in God's realm, death is abnormal. We're not supposed to die. Mice, birds, fish are not supposed to die. Death is a condition that was not present when God created the world. The world became polluted by sin and then things became abnormal. Abnormality is detestable to Jehovah. Death is the most abnormal condition that exists. At the end of chapter 11, when we discuss more about purity and, and about holiness, we're going to talk about what's normal and abnormal and how it has so much to do with what God has declared clean and unclean. Beginning in verse 32, another angle concerning uncleanness is stated. It is that what, whenever an unclean animal, an unclean dead creature falls upon, that thing becomes unclean. Actually, the English translation kind of obscures the real Hebrew meaning of this sentence. And what it says is that what, whatever an undead, uh, rather an unclean dead animal falls onto becomes unclean, and whatever an unclean dead creature falls into becomes unclean. So if a mouse dies and falls on top of your sandal, that's one condition. If a mouse dies and falls into a cooking pot, that's another condition. Of course, one has to do with a more or less serious type of uncleanness. Well, now that things, uh, thing, now we know about how things become unclean, the next thing to discuss is how do you remedy that situation? And we will do that next time. Father God, I know how hard this is for your people. All of these rules and regulations. It is for us to take in and understand, especially, Father, because of the way we've been taught all of our Christian lives, that this has nothing to do with us. Well, Father, Christ says it does. And Father, I pray that we'll begin to understand these critical rules of purity and cleanness and what's prohibited for us and what is acceptable. But also, Father, that since this is about like learning the multiplication tables and it can be tedious, that you'll keep us alive and awake and alert so that we can hear. And so, Father, that we can put this into our thinking on a day-by-day -day basis and not misunderstand what you're saying. Lord, we love you and we understand that you have divided away those who you set apart as holy from those who are not. From those things that are for us in this world and those things that are against us in this world. And Lord, we want to learn to honor those things in our lives. So Father, teach us. Verify it all through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And let us follow those ways and not the ways of mankind. We bless your holy name here, Lord. Amen. Okay, have a good week.